Okay, uh, let's get started for today's class. Uh, estimators and limit theorems. Okay, so estimators, what the goal for today's class is to understand that I'm the following question. So I'm looking at the data uh, from some source. So I'm looking at the temperature data coming out of this thermostat, or I could be looking at the temperature data coming out of all the thermostats in this building, or I could be looking at the rotation sensor data coming from a vehicle and so on and so forth. So I'm looking at this series of data. I'm assuming that the environment itself is not changing. Okay, so everything is stationary. So if you're driving the car, you're driving it at a constant velocity on the highway. So, so I'm looking at this data, okay, and the data is getting generated every uh, 100 milliseconds or every 10 milliseconds or every second or every minute. Um, and the question is, how do you, how do we determine some properties of that particular data? So for instance, um, we are interested in understanding what the mean of the temperatures inside the room is. And mean means the average temperature inside the room is over a period of a day or over the period of a, of a year. What's the average temperature? So that's one parameter that we would like to know about the temperature or the, the distribution of the temperature inside the room. We could also, we also want to know what the variance of that temperature data looks like. So mean and variance of course is some very specific parameter but there are other situations where we would like to know some more complicated stuff about that, uh, about that system. So for instance, uh, I want to know the mean, I want to know the variance but I also want to know how the temperature is evolving over during the day, right? So that's another uh, the evolution equation for the temperature is another parameter that I would like to know about this particular sensor. So all of that stuff is studied under the umbrella of estimators and why are estimators useful becomes clear when we understand limit theorems. So there are two limit theorems that I'll be talking about today. One is the central limit theorem uh, and the other one is uh, law of large numbers. Okay, so those are the two limit theorems we will talk about today. Uh, but before I talk about limit theorems, let's understand why limit theorems are important. Let's try and understand what estimators are. So without, uh, we have talked about normal distribution, so let's continue our discussion with uh, normally distributed random variables and then we will try and extend it to other random variables. So let's assume that y1, yn are IID Gaussian with mean mu variance sigma square or sigma y square. So I have a bunch of random variables n, y1 to yn. Uh, each of them is just a scalar quantity. So yi maps omega to r. just a real number. It has a mean mu and it has a variance sigma y square. So if I look at the temperature of this room uh, for 24 hour period, so at the, at the beginning of every hour, I'm going to look at the reading and I'm going to record it as yi. So y1 will be the temperature at 1 a.m., y2 is temperature at 2 a.m., yn is or temperature at n a.m. or p.m. Um, and there is a mean mu, which in the case of this room, it would be somewhere around 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And there is some variance sigma y square, which again for this room would be somewhere around maybe a one or two degrees Fahrenheit square. Okay, now let's assume that I don't know the mean and I don't know the variance of this temperature. So, sorry. Uh, 
So, so I just put a new thermostat in this room and I don't have any past data, I don't know anything, so I'm just going to collect the data and I want to know what the average temperature of the room is and what the average variance of the room temperature is. So how do we estimate mu? So let's say I want to estimate mu. What do you think would be a good estimate? I have the readings for 24 hour period. I want to estimate mu. How do you think we should do that? What would be a good way to try and figure out what the mean looks like or what the average mu looks like, average temperature of the room looks like over the 24 hour period? Any thought? Sum of those divided by n. So let's, let me call it mu hat. No, let me call it y bar. 1 over n summation of yi, i equals 1, over 1 to n. OK, I think that's uh, reasonable. How do I compute the variance? sigma y square. How do I estimate sigma y square? Any suggestion? Okay. Okay. So let me write it as S tilde square, which is 1 over n summation of y i minus y bar square. This is what you are suggesting, right? Any other thoughts? Any other ways to estimate sigma y square? So we have one possible estimator. Any thoughts? Sorry? From a previous sigma y estimate. So this is what we want to estimate. And I just, I, the only thing I have is the data set. I have like y1 to y and that's the only thing I know. And my goal is to estimate mean and I have, my goal is to estimate sigma y square. Any other ways to estimate sigma y square? Okay, let me put another estimation. W 1 over n minus 1 summation i equals 1 to n yi minus y bar square. So the only way it differs from his estimator is I put a n minus 1 in the denominator whereas he puts n in, in, in the denominator. That's the only difference but these two are, sorry? Yeah, this is the biased estimator, this is the non-biased but both of them are consistent estimators so that's what we'll be talking about today. Okay, so a few questions arise, okay, is this a good estimate? Uh, if it is a good estimate, how do we know it's a good estimate? If it is not a good estimate, how can we change the estimator to, to assure, my, uh, assure ourselves that it's a good estimator? Okay, so these are the things that we need to worry about. So before we go into that, before we understand what the estimator, whether the estimator is good or bad, let's try and understand what the distribution of these random variables look like. So remember yi is a random variable, so y bar is also a random variable, yi is a random variable, y bar is a random variable, so s tilde square is a random variable and similarly s square is a random variable. So we first want to understand what is the uh, what is the mean and covariance of this random variable. Now, one thing, of course, you know uh, from our previous discussion is when you have Gaussian random variables and you add them up, it still retains the Gaussianity, which means that the distribution is still a Gaussian random variable. So, So let's, let's think about what the mean expected value of y bar is.
what is the expected value of y bar? So 1 over n summation i equals 1 to n expected value of y i over n which is mu. So it looks like the average value of y bar over multiple runs should be equal to mu. What about the variance of y bar? So this should be expected value of y bar minus mu square because mu is the mean. So I can now compute the variance. And after doing all the, well, let's do the computation. Summation expected value of 1 over n summation yi minus mu square i equals 1 to n. So all the cross terms in the square would be 0 because they are uncorrelated. They are IID random variables. They are uncorrelated. <coughs> what is this equal to? Right. Okay, so Can someone tell me what the variance is equal to? So this is the expression. Now you can plug things in and tell me what the variance is equal to. So variance is equal to this expression. I expanded the expression, then I have like a lot of I have the square term and then I have cross terms. The cross terms are going to be 0 because they are IID random variables. So this is what I'm left with. And then I can take the 1 over n square because it's constant. I can take it outside. The summation, I can take it outside. So all I'm left with is expectation of yi minus mu square. What is this equal to? sigma y square because that's what the variance is for each of the random variables. So if you do the math, it turns out that this is sigma y square over n. So let us consider the temperature of the room. Remember that the mean is 70 and the variance is of the order of 2 degrees Fahrenheit. It's not, so the temperature of the room is not IID Gaussian, but let's for the sake of argument assume that it's, it follows an IID Gaussian distribution. Uh, if I look at this estimator, a estimator for mu y bar, then the expected value of y bar is mu, but the variance of y bar is actually sigma y square over n. What happens, now remember sigma y square is 2 degrees Fahrenheit in our case, 2 degrees Fahrenheit square in our case. Now, what happens when n is 24? 
which is a 24 hour period. So when n is 24, uh, this is 2 over 24, so 1 over 12. As I increase the value of n, now I'm running it for 4 days, I'm running it for 10 days, I'm running it for 30 days. This n is increasing and increasing. So what, what's happening to the variance of y bar, variance of your estimator? It's actually going down, okay? What happens when the variance goes down? The random variable no longer remains, uh, I mean it doesn't look like a random variable anymore, it becomes more and more deterministic because the variance is very small. Okay, so if your n is going, if n is a million, which by the way in some application a million is not much, if you're collecting data every millisecond, a million can be reached within a thousand seconds, like you can get a million data points within a thousand seconds. Uh, if your systems are running at microsecond scale, you can reach a million within like one second. So sometimes n, you know, I'm saying one million, but sometimes one million may not be a large number. You could literally reach it within a hundred seconds or a uh, uh, thousand seconds, depending on the application. So, so as n grows large and large, as n becomes a million, the variance actually becomes very small, which means that the <coughs> value of y bar approaches the mean, mu, when n is very large. And what does that imply? It implies that this estimator for mu appears to be a good estimator in some sense. So because if I have, if I collect more data, um, I know that this value y bar will approach mu, which is what we wanted to estimate to begin with, okay? So it seems to be a good estimator for mu. Okay. Now let's look at uh, the estimator for sigma y square. So I have two estimators, one is s tilde square, one is s square. Let's try and figure out, well, maybe we shouldn't figure out, and I'll tell you what exactly this uh, random variable looks like. Can I erase this side? Has everyone noted it down? Okay. So I have s square or s s tilde square. Let me write just s square because it's the same thing. <clears throat> so I have s square. What is the expected value of S square? We'll, do, we'll go through the same approach. So I'm going to look at one over N minus one, no. Oh yeah, one over N minus one summation. expected value of y i minus y bar square. Okay, now this is going to be a bit challenging. Uh, so this is not a uh, variance because this is not mu. If I knew the mu, then then yes, I could replace y bar with mu and then it becomes a variance and you are right. But again, that is also mean, right? Uh, this is estimated mean. This is the estimator. This is not the true mean. True mean is mu. True mean is mu. Okay. Right, so mu is, the, mu is true. This is estimate. 
And right now, of course, I'm assuming that I don't know the mean mu. And so I just want to estimate the mean and the variance using just the data. That's my goal. If I knew the mean mu, I could plug it in here and then what you're saying makes perfect sense. Okay. So let's do this. Uh, this is going to be a very complicated expression. So So let me look into. Sorry. That is the population mean. Uh, we are not looking at no we are not looking at normalized random variable right now. So the normalized one would be y i minus mu over sigma y. That would be a normalized random variable. So we are not looking into that. I'm not normalizing my random variable right now. Okay, so let's look at the expected value of each of the terms. So what is the expected value of yi square? That is my mu square plus sigma y square. So this is a expected value of random variable square is mean square plus the covariance. What is the expected value of y bar square? So that's also the mean plus covariance square. So mean was mu square plus covariance was sigma y square over n. And what is the expected value of y i y bar? So that is expected value of 1 over n summation y i y j j equals 1 to n and that is equal to mu square plus sigma y square. Okay, so I have the expression for each of the expectation. The first one comes directly from the assumption. The second one comes from the previous calculation, mean square plus the covariance. And the third term, I just expanded the y bar, which is one over n summation of yj. And then it turns out that this is expected value of one over n. Let me just write it so you know where this is coming from. This is 1 over n expected value of y i square, which is equal to 1 over n mu square plus sigma y square. Okay, so I have a very long expression now, which I need to collect. 
Okay, let's look at what inside the expectation is. So expected value of y i square Which one? This one? So expected value, okay. So expected value of x square equals to mean square plus variance. Uh, why, why should this be true? So I can write expected value of x square equals to expected value of x minus mu plus mu square. And then I have plus two x minus mu mu. So this is the mean square part. This part is zero. And this is the variance part. Any other question? That would be variance, variance square. Well, variance is typically sigma y square. So if you call variance sigma y, then yes, it would be variance square. But in statistics, typically variance is a square of sigma y. Okay, everyone agrees with this expression. Cool. So now let's try to compute this expression. Okay, I'm going to erase this part. If everyone has noted it down. Well, some people are still writing, so I'll just wait for a Okay. So now we need to collect all the terms here in this expression. So I have mu square plus sigma y square plus mu square plus sigma y square over n minus 2 over n mu square plus sigma y square. I'm trying to think if there is some The mean should not appear here. We should only have sigma y square here. But there seems to be the mean is not cancelling out and I'm trying to do a troubleshooting whether the mean has to cancel out or not.
I have yi square, y bar square. I guess this n should not be a. Uh, no, actually, it's no, actually there should be 1 over n with uh, sigma y square, but there should not be any n with the mu square. But here the mu square is not getting cancelled. The sigma y square expression looks correct. What I actually have is that the expected value of this is 1 over n minus 1, n minus 1 sigma y square. This is what it turns out to be. And so the n minus 1, n minus 1 gets cancelled and all you are left with is sigma y square. But that's not what I'm getting there. Uh, and I'm trying to do some troubleshooting to see where I may have made a mistake. This is what I'm supposed to get. This is the answer. And I'm not getting that. Unless I'm missing something. Is the summation of the expected values still from i to n after dividing by n minus 1? Because here I think i oh. is right? Sorry? Uh, uh, here I let me, okay, let me, okay, his suggestion is I have not really, really done the summation, so maybe some things might cancel out there. Let me try to do it. I'm pretty sure I'm not going to get this answer, but this is the right answer. Let me keep doing it and see if I'm able to get it, because I don't see any mistakes in my calculation here. Everything looks correct. Of course, if I assume that my mu is zero, then I'm done. Then, then I don't have to worry about it. But this holds true even for the case where mu is not equal to zero. So that's why I want to do it in full generality and not assume that mu is equal to zero. So let me, let me continue with my calculation, but with a caveat that I may be, somewhere there is a mistake that I'm not able to find out right now. Let's just continue, nonetheless. So this gives me, 2 minus 2 over n, so 2, 1 minus 1 over n mu square plus 1 minus 1 over n sigma y square. Yeah, this really has to cancel out. Uh, what am I doing wrong? Yeah, this term has to be zero. Uh, there is something funny going on here. So anyways, uh, this expression is correct. Okay, maybe, I don't know, it should be equal to zero. So let's try to pretend that this is not there. I'll do the troubleshooting later after the class and I'll send you an email when I figure out what the problem was. So let's pretend that this term is zero. Somehow in the calculation it gets cancelled. I'm left with one minus one over n sigma y square and so the expected value of s square would be 1 over n minus 1, n times n minus 1 over n sigma y square. So this n comes because I have summation i goes from 1 to n. And so this is equal to sigma y square. <coughs> Mm. 
Yeah. Do you have a question? Here, right? Do I have n in the denominator here? I don't think so. Uh, so I have expected value of yi square which is mu square, expected value of y bar square and I think it will be mu square here as well because mean of y bar is mu. Yeah, mean of y bar is mu, the variance is sigma y square over n, that's what we derived in the previous uh, like when I erased the broad. Yeah, there is something here which I may be missing. There may be some term here which I may be missing. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. The reason that, that um, it should not be 1 over n u squared. It should just be u squared uh, plus, it should be basically the same as y bar squared. Right. Yeah, I think there may be some some error here, some, something may be wrong here. The mu square is, is 1 over n times the summation, so the 1 over n is just multiplied by the sigma squared, not mu squared. Right? So inside the parentheses. So I have summation of yi, yj. Yeah. And yi, yj's are. Oh, of course. Yeah. That's right. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, for some reason I was thinking that they are uncorrelated mean zero random variables, but they are not. They, they have a mean. So this is 1 over n summation expected value of yi expected value of yj. Uh, j equals to 1 to n. So that is mu square. No, I'm wrong. So this is j equals 1 to n, j not equals to i, and then there is plus expected value of yi square, and this 1 over n gets. Okay, thank you guys. So. Now we are on the correct path. <laughs> uh, so for j not equal to i, yi and yj's are uncorrelated. So I have to take the expectation separately and multiply them. But in the case of j equals to i, I have expected value of yi square. And that gives me n minus 1 over n mu square plus 1 over n sigma y square. Okay. Now we are now we are in business. I have 2 multiplied by n minus 1 over n mu square plus 1 over n sigma y square. Oh, I am wrong again. 1 over n mu square. Now this is correct. OK. OK, now I am correct. So this is 1 minus 1 over n sigma y square. OK, good. We have. We have the correct expression now. <clears throat> okay.
okay any any question on this part this is where we got derailed from our discussion but now everything looks correct and this is the expression we get the final expression and then i plug it in here and i get that the expected value of s square is sigma y square let me erase this and remember s square is 1 over n minus 1 summation i equals 1 to n y i minus y bar square expected value of s square is sigma y square now remember we had this s tilde square and this is by following the same line of thought this is what we are going to get oh expected value of s tilde square Okay, so now we have two estimators for variance, uh, sigma y square, one is s square, which takes in the input as the entire data set and divides some expression by n minus 1. The other estimator I have is y i minus y bar square summation divided by n. Which of these two estimators do you think is a good estimator for sigma y square? If I ask you, if I give you the data set and I ask you to compute sigma y square, which one are you going to use? S square. The first one, the s square one. And why is that? Why wouldn't you pick s tilde square? So let's think about it in, uh, uh, okay, so let's look at it from the other way. So naturally, the expectation is sigma y square, so you would like to use this particular estimator. Now assume n is 1 million, okay, or 1 billion. Does it matter that I have n minus 1 over n here? It approaches 1 as n goes to infinity. So this term approaches 1 as n goes to infinity. So if I have lots and lots of data, it probably doesn't matter if I'm using s square or s tilde square. Okay, both of them is going to give me very similar answers. But there is something special about S square that we see here uh, where we think that this seems to be a good estimator no matter whether n is small or no matter whether n is large. For this we require the n to be very very large but for this it works even for n equals to 20, it works well for n equals to 50 and it works well for n equals to 1 billion. So this is known as an unbiased estimator. And this is known as a biased estimator. For sigma, sigma y square. <clears throat> That's just the nature of this, uh, these two estimators. So you can come up with your own estimators. I, I, I ha you have a bunch of data and you are allowed to come up with your own estimator for estimating some properties of that data. So in this case, the two properties that we were interested in was the mean and the covariance, but those are not the only properties. You could have transition kernel, you could have some other properties of random variables or some function of random variables, and you can come up with whatever the estimator you want to come up with uh, using whatever mathematical formula you want to use. 
and you will have the property that the expected if the expected value of that estimator is equal to the quantity of interest then it's an unbiased estimator if the expected value of your estimator differs from what you intend to estimate it's a biased estimator okay typically in real world you would prefer to use unbiased estimator because it's independent of n the bias is independent of n on the other hand in biased estimator you want to make sure that your n is very large uh, so that you converse to the value of interest and that that particular property where you have an estimator which is biased i mean it could be unbiased it could be biased but as n goes to infinity it converges to the uh, value of interest that is known as a consistent estimator so so if your estimator is consistent then as n grows large you will converge your your um, estimator would converge to the true value with very high probability okay now just for your knowledge we didn't really compute the variance of s square it's a very complicated expression all we computed was the mean but i just want to let you know that this random variable s square is chi square n distributed where this chi square distributed was uh, covered in a few lectures ago and it's there in the continuous distribution handout that i had given you uh, maybe last week so in the chi square distributed you needed two parameters one was the mean oh uh, one was the mean and the other one was what's the num degrees of freedom you have so in this case the degrees of freedom is n and the mean is of course sigma y square It means that there are n. Uh, uh, th that's yeah. There is in the chi-square distribution. There are two parameters. One is the n, and the other one is the mean. Those are the two things that specify the chi-square distribution. Just like in Gaussian, mean and the variance specifies the entire distribution. Okay. Uh, all right so now uh, i want to talk about limit theorems central limit theorem and the law of large numbers and you know there is of course a mathematical precision for the two limit theorems that i'm going to talk about uh but you know doing it in a precise way is going to take a lot of time so i'll just give you the rough idea of what central limit theorem says y1 to yn iid random variables they need not be gaussian it could be any random variable with mean mu variance sigma y square then expected value of no not expected value uh let me call a random variable zn as 1 over n summation y i minus mu over sigma y i equals 1 to n and i'm going to divide it by 1 over square root of n
So I subtract the mean from yi, I divide it by sigma y, I take the sum and I divide it by square root of n, not n but square root of n. Then this is, so if n is large, zn is approximately, approximately Gaussian distributed with mean zero and variance one. So as I increase the value of n, the random variable zn becomes approximately Gaussian distributed with zero mean and unit variance. That is the central limit theorem. And then we have law of large numbers. The hypothesis is the same here. I'm going to let Zn to be one over n summation of yi. i equals one to n. There are some mathematical conditions like the fourth moment has to be finite and all that stuff. But you know, if you are going to be practitioner, you're not going to see random variables with heavy tails. Um, so, so let's just uh, uh, see what, what the law of large numbers say. So law of large numbers says, if I take the average divided by n, then Zn converges to mu uh, as n goes to infinity. So zn is a random variable, but it actually converges to mu. Uh, so basically the variance of the random variable becomes smaller and smaller, and eventually the random variable itself becomes equal to mu as n goes to infinity. Okay, so these are the two important theorems, limit theorems. One which says that if you normalize the random variables and divide it by square root of n, it becomes an approximately Gaussian random variable. Um, in, in real world setting, uh, you know, there is a lot of IID random variables that affects your readings, your sensor readings. And therefore, the sensor readings that you typically get have a Gaussian distribution. Typically, you know, it's not, uh, for most physical processes, if you look at the distribution for the sensor, because of thermal noise and because of all the other randomness that happens in the environment, you will find that the distribution, the distribution of the sensor reading is usually Gaussian distributed. Some of it can be attributed to the central limit theorem. That's why you see this Gaussian distribution. The law of large number says you have a large number of IID samples of the data. You take the average. The average actually converges to the true mean uh, as n goes to infinity. And this convergence is actually in a very strong sense. It's actually uh, in, in, in what is known as an almost sure sense, which means that for practical purposes, Zn will always converge to mu as n goes to infinity. And the variance is going to shrink as n goes to infinity and at some point of time it will become zero. So zn will be equal to mu. Uh, limit of n goes to infinity, zn will be equal to mu. Okay, so
So that's all I have for today's class. In the next class, we are going to talk about hypothesis testing based on some of the ideas that we have developed in this class about estimators. So I'll see you on, on Wednesday. No, today is Wednesday, right? I'll see you on Friday. <laughs>